Good morning. Good morning. Good Hello. Morning. Another Welcome lovely back. sunny day, isn't it? It is. It's not. There's not a cloud in the sky. There is not actually a single oh. cloud in the sky. It's can, good. We, we like can this. say that with authority. That's your weather forecast from here in <laughs> the new forest. They're hydrated. Put on. Hey, sun what cream. about those black storks? Oh, pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, they are. We've looked at I them like before. They're in Poland, and uh, I would have imagined that they would have gone. To be quite honest with you, and mind you, there's mm. nothing to say they haven't flapped off that nest platform and then come back again. I suppose. Mm. Beautiful bird, the black stork, though. They're really good. A bit more elusive, slightly more shy than our white storks that we've been talking quite a lot about. Of course, white storks back breeding in the UK for the first time since 1416, which is pretty cool. But black storks, mm. they, they're they migrants over to the UK, aren't they? So we see the occasional one. Yeah, I was at Dungeness once. I was just down on the beach there, you know, liking mm. that environment. And, uh, beach? I was with you some... don't like beaches? No, but it's shingle. Oh, shingle, that's fine. Yeah. It's shingle. You know, I don't like <laughs> sand. Sand, salt. <laughs> And water, enemies of any sort of camera equipment, <laughs> sand, salt, of water, not a beach person. And then the sand between your toes as well, something sort of significantly unpleasant about mm. that. Anyways, However, stalks. yeah, move on. Yeah. So anyway, I was there, a bunch of birders were alongside me and they all went, oh, hey, oh and started pointing up. And obviously, I, you know, I, I sort of bleated like a sheep and looked up and there was a black stork flying over. It's the only one I've ever seen in the UK. That's uh, pretty cool, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is pretty cool. Um, pretty and cool. then their distribution in Europe, of course, is slightly different than white mm. storks. Um, there's a few in Portugal. Mm few in France, um, Spain, Spain, yeah, and then uh, then when the further east you go, there's a, a lot more of them, and they go as far north as the Baltic countries, you know, Latvia, Estonia, etc. Um, so it's not that they probably couldn't occur in the UK. They're migrants, mm. of course. They don't stay there in the winter. They, they could they, have they could have bred here, you know, thousands of years ago. Yeah. We have evidence that white storks bred here. And they probably disappeared from the rest of mainland Europe because they were persecuted. Mm. Or, and of course habitat loss, they need yeah. marshy, marshy. They still are marshy. persecuted in some areas. Uh, yeah, shot on migration. Mm. Anyway, look, anyway. you can check these ones out on the nest. These ones are doing really, really well yes. in Poland. And let's just give that website out there, Beastie. Yeah, so it's www.ku, that's k-o-o.org.pl. Mm. So ku, k-o-o.org.pl. Uh, it's the Polish Eagle Protection Committee, and you can watch those stalks in the Notekta Forest in mm. Poland. Fantastic stuff. Yeah, there's going to be some action there, I think, as those birds get more confident and start exploring the area around that nest. It's a good one to look out for. We've got lots today, though, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we do. Plenty of stuff coming so up. We've got plenty of stuff. Got a great poem written by Jamie Wyver, who works mm. for the RSPB called Zoophobia, coming up. Uh, we've got a lot of people to, to each do a line yeah. to that. Um, but it's a poem with a very distinct message. That's good. Got Peter Klein's film. Peter Klein is an mm. Irish filmmaker. This is a film that he made in lockdown. It's very beautiful. It's got big stuff in it, like, like herons. Don't want to give too much away. And then it's got small stuff in it, like wood lice. So there's a great range of different species yeah. in that. And then we've got Paul Harfley. Yes. We are great fans. Yeah, I'm sure fans. if you don't know who Paul is, if you're a member of the South African Bird Club on Facebook, you must know Paul by now and his incredible work. He's an amazing artist. Amazing. And um, someone, you know, who just, he's just so he, creative. He's very inventive as well. Very I'm going to talk to you about a couple of his projects yeah. uh, that he's been doing. He's done a special uh, yes. piece of artwork for us, actually, as well, which yeah, we'll tell you about. Yeah, very grateful for and that. And then lastly, well, not lastly, um, we've got um, Xander. Oh. Ant Boy. Xander. Honestly. Uh, Xander has so appeared good. a couple of times on the watches. Um, and he is a young man up in Scotland. And I have to say, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, you're not I needed. Know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm you're almost, not needed. almost redundant. Yeah, no, well, you're pretty much redundant. Almost. He, honestly, honestly, he, he is, is so, so talented. So good. So, so, so talented. Good. Anyway, he's going to be telling us man. about the big butterfly count yes. because it is the last weekend that you can be doing the big butterfly count. Last time I looked, 108,000. Uh, forms had been sent back, 15 minutes had been sent back to Butterfly Conservation. We're trying mm. to get it up to 125,000 by the end of the weekend. It is sunny in the south of England. Those insects will be active. So if you do have a chance this weekend, it's just 15 minutes of your time. Mm -hmm. And Xander's going to be telling us what you need to do a bit later on. So all good stuff there. Mm. On to the quiz. The quiz. On to okay. the quiz. Now every week we give you a sound. We ask you to try to identify what sound that animal it was a might be. <laughs> Let's just try not, to, it's, yeah. not, it's not no, a dunnock. It wasn't that one. It's not a dunnock. The dunnock is ruled out. That, that was the Let's one have that. a listen. Okay. Very distinctive. Mm, very distinctive. 
we've been a bit nice the thing again. Uh, yeah, yeah. After last week's, yeah. which only one person got white, right, <laughs> the, which was the barber style bat, yes. of course, which was pretty tricky. It was tricky. So, we like to fluctuate, you yeah. know, you can't have it easy all the time. No, but, you can't. But, you know, this one we've been quite nice with, I think. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, so, uh, a bit of update. First of all, um, you might have seen, if you were watching the last couple of weeks, uh, Fabian nursed the young Swift back to health and it went back into the wild. Um, coincidentally with that, uh, Megs and I picked up a, a goshawk which had flown mm. into presumably the window of the house here in the New Forest. And we'd taken it to the National Bird of Prey Centre at uh, the Hawk Conservancy near Wayhill in Hampshire. Open now. Mm -hmm. Lots of good Great social distancing there. Fantastic place to visit particularly this weekend. Um, anyway, the, the bird is there recovering, and I've just had an update from uh, Gary. <clears throat> he says that the vet examined it yesterday and gave it the all clear to go into the pre-release aviary. Uh, the, the toe, if you remember, he had a fractured toe, which we thought had occurred perhaps in the nest when it was fighting with its uh, rival siblings. Uh, he's happy with the toe, wants to see how it gets on in the pre-release, but the release could be as early as next Friday. Or if there's a problem this week, it may be able to push over to the following Friday, which is going to keep us posted and we can give you as much notice as possible. But of course, as mm. soon as that bird is ready to go back, we won't be wasting any time. Um, the staff of the Hawk Conservancy will bring it here to where it was picked up. We'll take it out to the woods and somewhere nice and quiet and they will release it. We'll be able to film that, whatever happens. Yes. So that will be, yeah, we'll be really, filming really, it. really good. Yeah. That's anyway, you. The, the thing is. Um, SIBC, when we set it up, it was all about us reveling in nature, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about the positivity. And in lockdown, of course, we all needed a connection. Um, we weren't seeing our families and friends. We spent more time in our gardens. We noticed the birds. We noticed the insects, the flowers that were coming up. And we connected to it like we've never done before. And we created this group so that we could celebrate that connection, so that we could look at all those details and feel something positive in amongst the kind of the crisis that was going on did. around us. And we did, and it was fantastic. But of course, Self-Isolating Bird Club is evolving. Now, we've gained that connection with nature. It's increased, it's heightened, it's at an all-time high, and it's been brilliant. But now we need to really turn around and be there for it. And in order to do that, Chris and I are going to start talking just a little bit more about some campaigns because we feel it's really important wildlife is really struggling and sometimes these campaigns aren't always you know easy they're not nice to hear about all no, the time no but they're so important because if we don't know and we don't understand then we're not motivated and empowered to make that change so please do stick with us and we're going to talk about well, various different things over the next coming weeks and we'll put another post out on the Facebook group to yeah. to say that the angle is changing a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's still going to be positive. We're it's still, still going to be a celebration of nature yeah. because that's what we love. That's why we do these campaigns is because ultimately we love it. We love it. And, you know, we want to yeah. be positive, don't we? Do. But on that account, tomorrow yeah. is a very important day in the uh, mm -hmm. nature calendar for the UK. It's Hen Harrier Day tomorrow. Yeah. And, of course, this year, due to the restrictions down to the pandemic, uh, it's being done virtually. And behind the scenes, an enormous number of people have worked very hard to put a lot of very interesting material together um, tomorrow. And Megan and I are very flattered that we're going to be hosting this. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to watch... Um, us well not all day but there will be things happening all day yeah so we've got a couple of hours that we'll be doing from here in the new forest introducing guests showing clips yeah. and films we've got art we've got music uh, we've got obviously ecology in the field got rspb got hen harrier action got loads of people involved in all of this it's sort gonna of be stuff. celebratory yeah it is it's yeah. all about celebrating the hen harrier understanding its predicament and thinking about what we can do about it mm -hmm. and uh, we'll give you a bit more details about that later on this morning but do try and join us tomorrow it's it's an important part of our calendar now hen mm. harrier day it brings an enormous and varied community of people together they don't all have the same ideas but they have a commonality of purpose mm. and that is that we want a better landscape here in the uk life that sometimes struggles to live in it things like the hen harrier anyway you've been out and about you've been talking I to have. yolo yeah i've been out and about talking to yolo so um, last was it last week? Goodness, yeah, it feels like a long time ago. Now. But last week, I was very fortunate enough to go to Wales, and this was an amazing experience because I I think I announced on SIBC that I had never seen a hen harrier live in the UK, flying around in the UK. So I got a message from Yolo, and well, off I went. So uh, I had a, a chat with Yolo. Um, there's a photograph of me at the nest and I went into the nest under license it's important to say so I went in with uh, Keith Offord who has a license to go and monitor these birds he very very kindly took me in to see these three Look chicks that, that are that a little bit late 
little bit late, you know, that, that most of the chicks had fledged at this point, but there was one nest that had still kind of remained. And I got the opportunity to go in to see hen harrier chicks. And I can't even describe my excitement. It was one of the most amazing moments that, you know, you're just going to remember for the rest of your life. Um, so I caught up with Yolo um, and we filmed a little interview because he can't unfortunately join us tomorrow live. So here is Yolo and I talking about that experience and the plight of hen harriers. Yolo, it was great to see you the other week. Yeah, it was lovely. And wasn't it nice to meet up oh. in a proper place, Megan, up on the moors watching hen harriers, oh. as, as it should be, really. It was so good. We don't really get to go out birding very much. I always see you and it's always working. So it's nice to go and actually watch some birds and do some wildlife stuff. And what better to go and see than hen harriers? <laughs> Yeah, do you know what? It's one one of the joys. I mean, it's been a difficult time, obviously, the last five months or so. It's been really hard. But one of the real joys for me is having more time to go up onto the moors to see my beloved hen harriers. So to be able to to share that with you was was extra special. Oh, I absolutely loved it because I think I said on South Isolation Bird Club fairly recently that I'd never seen one in the UK and then immediately I got a message from you saying come on up here <laughs> and then well, a couple of weeks later there we go. Yeah and, and what was nice is that usually by now all of the young have either, well, they've either failed or they've fledged you know, but we've got this one very very late pair thanks to Keith Offord who does all the hard work up there we've got this one very late pair so it was an opportunity for you to come up and to be able to sit with me and just just watch the pair and as soon as we got up there you know we had a food pass which is one of the most amazing sights in the whole of the bird world so so to get that immediately a male coming in with a vole passing it to the female she went underneath him flipped over on her back took the vole took it back to feed the young uh, how amazing was that? It was just acrobatics in the air. You see the male gliding in and he's calling, the female starts calling and they just meet together. And it's just like perfectly synchronised. And they did that so much. That day was really good, wasn't it? Because they did, I think, about eight food passes in total whilst we were there, which is incredible. Yeah, I don't think you are how lucky you are, Megan, because there have been opportunities, that there, there have been times, there have been days when I've been up on the moors and this is where, earlier in the year when they're on eggs, when I've watched for eight hours before getting one food pass. So to, I mean, we were only there for what, maybe a couple of hours, whatever it was, mm. two, three hours just watching and to get eight food passes. Now it's a good vol here, but that is a very, very good male as well. He's a good hunter. He knows where those best areas are. So he was back and forth, like, like a little yo-yo, wasn't he? <laughs> he was, he was constantly coming in. We couldn't keep up with him. <laughs> but it was great as well because we got to go got to, to obviously go in under license with Keith to go and see those chicks and that is something I never thought I'd be able to go and do because it's such you know a special nest a special area um, and that experience you know it just makes your hair stand up doesn't it to see those chicks they're hung, hunkered down in that in that nest and all in that moorland it's absolutely beautiful yeah and, and I must emphasize here that we we followed the law to the letter it was a lovely sunny day so the chicks were at that time probably about three weeks old so you know so they were old enough they were able to generate their own heat the female spent a lot of time away from the nest so keith was able to take you in when she was away so you went in and came back out and there was no sign of her so we caused no distress whatsoever and I've been really lucky, you know, I've been watching hen harriers on those moors in North Wales since I was, oh, I think I found my first nest when I was 11, 12 years old, 1974, I think it was. And, and so I've been spoilt a little bit, but every year when I go up, you know, I still realise just how lucky I am to be able to watch, to be able to go and look for these well, the nest of what is, I think, one of Britain's most amazing birds. When you think of everything that it does, everything that it has to put up with, it nests in a really isolated, quite harsh environment up there. Some years, you know, there's not much food. They struggle. And then on top of that, of course, there's all the persecution that they get. Thankfully, thankfully, not in that part of Wales. And to be able to sit and watch them it is a privilege that I enjoy year in, year out. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a lucky man. And it, it was. It was genuinely lovely to have you up there with your enthusiasm. You know, it, it was hard to keep you still. I, I, I think I had to put my hand on top of your head at one time because you were bouncing up and down. But, but it was. It was fantastic, Megan. It was brilliant. 
But of course, I'm left with that worry, you know, seeing those chicks, once they disperse, what is going to happen to them? Yeah, that's, that's what gets me as well. You know, it's not just the fact that they're being massacred. And let's be honest about this. You know, there are, there are lies, there are allegations from both sides. But, but there's no doubt at all that our hen harriers in certain parts of the UK are being massacred. You know, I'm talking about parts of Aberdeenshire. I'm talking about parts, of, well, North Yorkshire is particularly bad. Of course, the Peak District, parts of the Peak District as well. We know that it goes on, despite what people like Ian Botham say, hen harriers are not tolerated at all there for most of wales we've got two small areas of moorland where we have concerns in wales where we in one area we know persecution goes on in the other one we strongly suspect but outside of that i'm pleased to say that over most of wales our harriers are actually doing pretty well that area that keith mainly monitors that i help out i think 11 pairs um three failed one to the weather, two to foxes, which is natural. Eight have reared uh, 24 young, you know, which is, which is a good year. And that is enough not just to sustain the Welsh population, but to see the Welsh population increase as well. And the only reason, and I emphasise that, the only reason that it's not on the increase is because away from these breeding areas, we know some of the Welsh birds will wander across onto particularly some of the English moors, and in winter, they have what they call a communal roost, where sometimes two, three, four, sometimes more than that, birds will roost in the same rough area. We know that they're shot out of those roosts. And that is the sink for our Welsh birds. And that makes my blood boil. And that's why we all come together, isn't it? And we join up for Hen Harrier Day, when this year that's happening on the 8th, so tomorrow, we're all coming virtually. Normally we'd be gathered in a muddy field somewhere with raincoats on or maybe sunshine <laughs> if we were lucky. But, you know, now we are doing it virtually and it's going to be a great day. There's going to be art involved, music involved um, and lots of different programmes throughout the day because I think we're all fed up. We're all angry with this unjust persecution and, you know, it's got to stop. So by coming together to support Hen Harriers and Hen Harrier Day, hopefully we can reach new audiences and, I don't know, safeguard the future of these birds. Yeah, it's such an important day now, I think. Um, it's been going, well, this is the sixth year now, and it's getting bigger every year. And I think it's so important that people are able to have that outpouring of anger, of grief, and just to show the people in power, listen, we're not going to stand for this. We, we, we're getting very, very angry, and we get more people every year but I said in one hen harry day, I think it was the year before last or last year, one thing I would like to see done, Megan, that I think would be a massive help in this battle is if the RSPB or whether it's Natural Resources Wales, uh, Natural England, whoever it is, if they can fund small cameras on a hen harry nest and beam live pictures to these massive cities, to the middle of London, to a huge billboard in the middle of London where people are going to the office, they've picked up their coffee, they're walking to the office at half past eight and they see this picture of a nest and gradually over the weeks they'll fall in love as the chicks develop, as the chicks leave that nest and they will then be horrified when a lot of those chicks, as they inevitably will be, will disappear on a driven grouse moor they will be horrified. And it's until we can convince these people, the people of London, the people of Birmingham, the people of Manchester, the people of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Cardiff, Swansea, it's until we can persuade these people that these birds are worth fighting for, only then, I think, will we win this battle. But what people can do now is to join Hen, da Hen Harry Day tomorrow. Yes, very much so. We've already held uh, Hen Harry Day Wales, actually, at the end of July. And that was another virtual online one. And that was excellent. You know, we had a really nice list of speakers, um, ni nice kind of information in there as well. So and, and I, I can't join Hen Harry Day live because I, I'm sad, but I'm also pleased to say that I'm off up to Mull. Um, I'm, I'm working on Mull for five days. Of course, you know, where you've got a good population of hen harriers where they're not persecuted, where you've also got golden eagles, white-tailed eagles. So I'm really looking forward to that, but also sad that I'll be missing out on Hen Harrier Day for only the second time. I missed the first one and I'm going to miss this one, but I am 
taking part in, in this recorded piece with you. So I'm very pleased about that. But please, everybody, please do tune in. And if you're concerned about what you see and what you hear, get in touch with your local MP, get in touch with your local government, whether it's uh, the Welsh Government, whether it's Westminster, whether it's in Edinburgh. Let them know how you feel, because the more of us who do that, the more these members of Parliament, members of the Welsh Assembly, whatever it is, the more they will set up and take notice. Thank you so much, Yolo. We hope you have a fantastic time in Mull and see yourself some wonderful hen harriers. Thank you, Megan. Have a fantastic hen harrier day. Thank you. Fantastic stuff. Top mm. bloke, Yolo Williams, of course, and also a man who knows his hen harriers. He's yeah. grown up in that environment where those birds prosper. I used to see them down here in the winter when they would come to their winter roost in the New Forest, but they're not a bird that's easy to get to know um, in this part of the world, which is a shame. I used to see them in France, I used to come into the garden in France, and uh, but uh, Yolo's been up there on those hills, year after yeah. year, going out and helping to survey and record all of those birds, fantastic stuff. And of course, as we mentioned uh, earlier, Hen Harrier Day tomorrow, the uh, 8th of August, so all day, basically, we have films that we can be playing. Megan and I are going to do a couple of hours where we can do some live interviews mm -hmm. with people from the RSPB, all sorts of yeah, uh, guests really that we've got too. coming on. Um, and lots of material you've been out there we've got some film of that as well yeah yeah loads I've of been out. loads of content indy green is going to be around yeah we, we try to go and see the bearded vulture you have to wait and see whether we saw it or not on how that ended excellent excellent i think i know how that yeah. might have ended i saw the pictures <laughs> quite copious amounts of rain um, a bit. so do try and join us tomorrow we'll be flagging it up on social media of course the place to go is youtube.com slash hen harrier day youtube.com slash hen harrier day i think tomorrow we're on between 10 mm. and 11 uh or is it 11 or 12 10 and 11 i believe no i don't know we'll be letting you know we'll let you know we'll let you know we're on for an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon hen harrier day uk on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube.com slash Hen Harrier Day UK. UK. <laughs> Catch up with all that stuff tomorrow. It'd be brilliant, mm. brilliant, brilliant stuff. Megs, honestly, yes. now I'm so excited about introducing oh. this uh, next guest, Paul Harfley. He's brilliant, isn't he? Oh, he's just amazing. Every day, he just brightens my day every time I go onto social media and he's done another post. If you don't know, honestly it's going to blow your mind yeah so paul is yeah. an illustrator who uh, paints uh, well illustrates birds paints birds mm. and uh, he puts up the picture of the bird that he's painted yeah but then he also presents himself as he sees as much as he can uh, a, a human representation of that bird so he puts on the right color clothing he puts on the right type of makeup and he really captures the look at the bird let's have a look at a couple of them now that we've got we've got here's paul here's his robin this is one of my favorites and, you know? and him as that robin i love that one. he's a strikingly handsome man as you can see mm. and he's got that's that's relatively subtle that one he's got that little bit of red ready orangey t-shirt yeah, underneath a little the bit rest. of the eye shadow but look there. at the, the attention to detail what i like about paul is his attention to detail is absolutely precise absolutely precise it's absolutely brilliant look at this one goldfinch go. I love that. Superb. The jacket and everything is just perfect to represent the wings, isn't superb. it? Superb. Absolutely superb. Now, come on. It, 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 we got the roller. We've got roller. Not yet. No. Not so we've got the next one. Oh, we've bullfinch. got the bullfinch. bullfinch. Oh, come on. I, know. I mean, bullfinch is a very suave. And look at him there. I know. Looking I know. very suave, Paul. Yeah. He look great. Brilliant. I love that. I love multi, that multi talented. Yeah. Not only illustrating the birds, but also. Um, doing that as well well we saw these and, and we thought they're absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. so we said to him look hen harrier day is coming up how do you feel about doing a hen harrier so of course he yeah, turned his he skills to, to that for, for <laughs> us and set to work on a hen harrier look so here that. is the finished work male hen harrier there oh. And there he is. Where he gets that? I mean, I haven't got a hen harrier jumper in my collection. You're going to want it, you? Look, you could be I mean, searching you know, for that jumper. His wardrobe must be extensive. It covers most <laughs> of the most of the world's bird fauna. Either that, or he's down the charity shop, <laughs> searching yes. through, thinking about the plumages of birds and how he might be able to. You, you know, <laughs> they don't look. That doesn't look like a charity shop jumper. Oh, I've got to say, no, no, I know exactly. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And the good news is that um, one of Paul's prints, which you can purchase online, mm -hmm. he has given and is going to be auctioned tomorrow to raise money for hen harrier conservation so yeah. what about that it's pretty good stuff isn't it really really good stuff so you can yeah. see the website there 
you know, go and have a look at his website. Now, he also runs another remarkable project, which I think is absolutely brilliant. I've been looking at it over the last mm. few days. He runs something called the Pansy Project. And, yeah. and this is just so imaginative. He's a very, very talented bloke. And it's taken off all over the world. So Paul was offended uh, a few years ago when he was at the receiving end of some very unpleasant homophobic remarks. Mm. And he thought, OK, what can I do to hit back in a way which is obviously peaceful, non-violent, imaginative, creative, and will get people thinking about how unpleasant homophobia is. So what he decided to do was to seek out all of those places where he could find where people have been the victims of homophobic uh, abuse, and there he would plant a pansy. A single pansy. Single pansy. In the right in the yeah. spot. He'd find an area of soil and plant a pansy. And I have to say... It is absolutely beautiful. A lot of them, you know, there's spawns in France, there's some in America, there's Hong Kong, but of course a lot Canada. around the UK, Canada too. So there he is Belgium around London, recently. Belgium. Yeah. So it's springing up all over the place. But, but then he doesn't just yeah. leave the pansy. He photographs the pansy mm. and he gives the, that, that photograph, beautiful photographs and pieces of artwork, you know, so that some of the pansies become permanent because they're painted onto walls and other structures in the urban environment. Um, and he gives each one of these a title which is based upon the abuse which was wrought upon uh, the, 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 the victims. It's very poignant stuff. It's very poignant stuff. And yeah. I think it's a great creative, imaginative way to draw people's attention to the horrors of continuing homophobia. Mm. Really, really good. He's made films about it. Yeah. I mean, it's a brilliant idea and it's taken off all over the world. So mm -hmm. do check out that as well. The yeah. Pansy Project website is fantastic. Yeah, make sure you do. It's a cre very creative brilliant. place. All of his illustrations are there. Yeah. All of his artwork and of course more details about his pansy project too which is just so good honestly it really is yeah really really good really, yeah really good okay coming up next we have a poem yes we do ja we? jamie wyver yes. Jamie Wyther, he's written a poem called uh, Zoophobia. Now, some of these remarks I thought were quite you know, fascinating, aren't they? I, you know me, I love folklore. I love all those kind of ridiculous yeah. claims that animals can or can't do certain things. They think that. And he has written a fantastic poem and got a collection of people together to read different parts of that. So let's have a little look at it now. Once a proud nation of animal lovers. But most now know nothing of otters and plovers. The papers say we should keep children indoors. To keep them all safe from sharp teeth and claws. I expect that one day we'll have this set of rules. Up in the classrooms of primary schools. Ants are a pest. No flying ones, please. We're bothered by badgers, buzzards and bees. Cormorants concern us. They look a bit scary. The sight of a dolphin should make us wary. Eels are too slimy and everyone sees that we shouldn't touch frogs they all have a disease gulls on the rampage they go for the eyes we must stop the hen harriers dance in the skies insects in general who needs those jackdaws are dodgy they eat children's toes the beak of the kingfisher could puncture a lung avoid lace wings and ladybirds you might get stung Kill a moth's bite, or at least eat your clothes. Be nervous, ninite jars. They'll peck off your nose. Don't trust an owl or pine martin at night. Or question a queen wasp. Stay out of sight. Rats never top of our Christmas card list. Stay away from seals, they can break a man's rest. The Temic stint, as you know, is a terrible demon. While unbeliferous plants want to kill you with poison. Vipers will strike when you least expect. And there's no good in weasels that we can detect. Thankfully, no ex creatures roam on our land. But what have the yellowhammer and zebra spider got planned? While it's true that all wildlife needs space and respect. If animals feel threatened, what do you expect? The rest is just nonsense. Don't let headlines scare you. Right now, nature needs us and we need it too. I like the way that went. Mm. I like the way that whole thing went. There were so many prejudices, so many intolerances about wildlife out there. Just little things in everyday yeah. life. 
And Jamie's really encapsulated that. You know, I always thought about making a T-shirt which said, we love wildlife until it's a nuisance and then we kill it. Mm-hmm. And, and when you think about it, that's what it's like, isn't it? Yeah. Everyone, you know, they, oh, they love all those flowers over there with the, with the bees buzzing on them. But, but ultimately the, not on their space. But when the wasps come, oh. oh. And how many people do you know? Okay. SIBC viewers, wildlife lovers. Mm. How many people do you know who, you know, love their blue tits and they love their, you know, dormice and they love all that sort of stuff. But when the wasps come, they call pest control. Mm, mm, mm. How many people do you know that complain about rodents? Oh, when you get a rat and it's, you know, oh, chaos. That's a great mice. You talk about. <laughs> Yeah, you're the worst for that. You're the worst. Oh, talk about digging a hole with no ladder, lo- oh, you mice. know, long enough. Yes, the the mice. And mouse update: no damage this week. No damage. Yeah, I feel like they're uh, they're trying to make an apology. They're trying to worm their way back into your good books. Yeah, they are. No damage this week. They're fed up of having to walk back. Jamie, thank you very much for that, and all, all those contributors. It was a really good poem. Makes, yeah, it makes you think about the really fact good. that we do need to, ex- you know, extend that tolerance to every single species yeah. and respect all of that wildlife that tries to share its space with us. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Very important. It's, it was its space that we've taken up. Bear in mind. That's the mm. key thing. Anyway, it's time for soapbox. So, what have we been discussing? We've been mm. um, we've been going on about plastic grass. We did. We went on about we went on about disposable masks. Disposable masks. Yeah. 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 We got ourselves into a bit, little bit of trouble when we were talking about dogs because we were misunderstood a little bit. Yeah, we were misunderstood. We were only saying that we didn't think they ought to be off the lead on nature reserves. It was it was just that. Anyway, this week yeah. it's litter, <laughs> but specifically a type of litter. Mm-hmm. It's that litter which comes from fast food outlets. <sighs> Now, fast food outlets, right, they generate an enormous amount of litter because they've got so much packaging. Yeah, Coca-Cola is one of the worst companies. Is it? Yes, in terms of litter. Coca-Cola is absolutely horrendous. And, of course, you've got things like McDonald's, which is everywhere. Kentucky Fried. Oh, the whole thing. All of these people. So they're generating all of that waste. Much of it, it's questionable whether it's recyclable. But most importantly, it doesn't get recycled. It gets dumped into the environment. Mm. So... We were one. I mean, do you know, sometimes I've gone down to the mm. gate here and there's been so much material from one of these fast food outlets, which is quite close to where we are. I felt like collecting it over a period of weeks mm. until I get like three or four bin bags full of it and then going into that fast food outlet and just tipping it all over the floor and saying, do you want it? Because mm. I don't want it, you know, in my driveway. It's a conversation, isn't it? Because a lot of people say that it's the consumer's responsibility to dispose of that packaging properly. Um, and that's often the outlet that these fast uh, food companies have, is that once it leaves our shop, it is no longer their responsibility. It's the person who purchased it. But surely, you know, it's happening such, you know, a magnitude. Well, firstly, they're producing so much of it. Yeah. And, and, and then the question is, did they ought to be taxed on the amount of packaging mm. that they produce and that tax be used to pick up that litter? Yeah. Or did we ought to sort of put, you know, you know tracing on it so you can see who bought that litter? I don't know. It's, becoming, right. it's yeah. becoming a bit big That'd brother, be isn't it? That would but be a I mean, bit the, tricky, I the point is there's an enormous amount of fast food litter out there and the plastic bits mm. of it are a real problem. If you're in a city, there's this misconception that if something goes down a drain, it's going to get filtered out somewhere and, you know, recycled. It isn't. Those drains can lead directly into, I'm talking about the drains on the side of the road. They can lead directly into the rivers, which lead directly into the sea. So if you dump plastic waste in the city and it goes down a drain, it can end up in a whale or a turtle. can. And yeah. all of this stuff is Microplastics out Microplastics that... The fish ingest that we end up ingesting it's a whole stop vicious cycle but this is the conversations that we need to have you know what well, chris and i we you know soapbox relatively frequently <laughs> <laughs> we're quite good at soapboxing but of course it's important to have the conversations about how those solutions can come about yeah how do we solve it and um, so that's kind of what our soapbox on SIBC is about. So it's a conversation. If you have ideas, put them in the comments. We'd like to hear and them. And also visit the Keep Button Tidy yes. website. Keep Button Tidy have done some fantastic research in recent years looking at the impact of plastic waste and other fast food waste mm. um, on our wildlife. And they found that it had a significant impact, particularly when plastic bottles were being thrown out of cars onto uh, road verges. Yeah. 
um, where they, if they're open without the cap on, they become a trap for small mammals. And they calculated an enormous number of small mammals meet their ends in those plastic bottles that get dumped out of car windows. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Litter is not just an unsightly mess, it's also a nuisance when it comes to wildlife and we do think that we ought to be doing something specifically about that. Maybe yeah. we should, uh, yeah, start a campaign. For yeah. Those. Oh, hold on, peacock, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, start a campaign for that. Uh, anyway, moving back, yes. during lockdown, Peter Klein decided to get his camera out and make uh, a film. And it's a very, very beautiful film. It reminds mm. me of one of the sort of mindfulness moments that we had on, is, yeah. on, on Spring Watch. It is a so it does have music, but nevertheless, the pictures are quite exquisite. Beautiful, as you'll see now, mm. uh, pictures of bat-lit herons fishing. And even the little things play a role in Peter's film. Have a look at this. Beautiful stuff. Oh, 
just exquisite. It just makes you relax, doesn't I it? I know. You can sit back and just watch and enjoy, and it just brings you so much. Love peace. the woodlouse, of course. Yeah. Fan of woodlouse. I love the woodlouse. Also, that shot at the end with the heron where it catches the fish and then it shakes it in slow mo, and the weed comes off, and you can see the sun going That's through cool. the. You know the fish fins is is absolutely fantastic. Now look, here are the details. Um, Peter Klein, you can find him Kleinep at Kleinep. So that's C A C L Y N E P, C L Y N E P at Kleinep on Twitter and Facebook. And we, we'd also like to credit Atlas, who did the music for that. Mm. Um, and Amaryllis and the Birds of Paradise. It was called Amaryllis and the Birds of Paradise by Atlas, top work, top work, fantastic stuff. And, and thank you, Peter, very much mm. for sending us that and allowing to use it on our, on our broadcast this morning, which is, which is really, really good, really good. Now, I was out in the woods and look what the poodles found. Yes, <laughs> it's the feather of a goshawk. Now, how do we know that it's the feather of a goshawk, not a buzzard? Uh, well, it's because you see these dark stripes here if the dark stripe continues over the ratchet, the vein here, so there's pigment on the ratchet, as you can see there is there a little bit of pigment on the ratchet, that tells you that it's a goshawk and not a buzzard. Of course, the colour and the patterning might also tell you that, but if there was any confusion at all, the dark stripe continuing across the ratchet tells you it's goshawk. Now look, it's all a bit ragged here. I think this has been molted by an adult goshawk and then the youngsters in the nest, because the female will molt while she's incubating and brooding, because the male's doing most of the work, so she can afford not to be at her absolute peak of flying fitness when it comes to catching food. So the female, sparrowhawks and goshawks, molt whilst they're incubating and brooding. The male's not until much later on. They can't afford to lose a few feathers when they're trying to service the female and all of those chicks for a lot of the time. So I think this was molted, uh, by the female in the nest and then all of this damage to it here has been done by the young goshawk chicks whilst they've been bored in the nest and picking it around and then somehow or other it must have flown or actually got carried uh, some distance before it was on the ground and recovered by a small black poodle <laughs> what about that yeah and you can even see look here where the sort of cut marks are can you see those sort of cut marks but the and there, look, yeah, look at that. Look, look, see that cut marks there where those young goshawks have been nibbling? That's what I think. Nibbling happened. goshawks. That's what I have. I mean, that's the sort of romantic notion that I've got in my mind. That, You've got this whole story. Yeah, I've made out. a. But I like that. You go out in the woods for a little stroll around with the poods, they start sniffing. You think, oh, what's that? I'll have a look. And then you take the feather off of them and then you sit there and you imagine a whole story. I quite like that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a fair degree of scientific validity there. Maybe a little bit of exactly. romance too. But, you know, does it really matter? Does it really You matter? should start making, like, your storybooks about them. What, fe out of feather, yeah, about, feathers, about your, feather stories? Yeah, what about your adventures in the woods and these stories that you kind of... Funny you should say with? that. <laughs> Funny you should say that. I have been writing about my time in the woods with the poodles. Yeah. Anyway, um, we are almost out of time. We are almost out of time, but... Not before we go to Xander. Xander is known as Ant Boy. You will have might have seen him on some of the watches from Spring Watch and yeah, Autumn yeah. Watch up in Scotland, where you've been yeah. up at the Cairngorms. Yeah. And when I saw him on Spring Watch, I think for the first time, I think I messaged you whilst you were still on live, and I just said you step down. Yeah, there's yeah. no point. Yeah, you know, Xander is the most knowledgeable, fantastic. Yeah. young presenter very good entomologist he's good amazing on his, good on his insects absolutely and other amazing um and of course over the last few weeks we've been talking to you a little bit about the big butterfly count a really important citizen science project where we've been asking you to go out find a spot a patch and just stay for 15 minutes and note down all of the species you can download the big butterfly count app or you can have this image here so now there is more from this from xander as he explains just what to do I'm here in the Cairngorms to chat to you about some of the local Scottish species that you may find when out and about during the big butterfly count. To me, butterflies and moth are awesome! The whole cycle they go through when transforming from a caterpillar to the adult is amazing! In the UK, we have 57 common species of butterflies, with two migrant species that visit us each year. And in Scotland, I'm lucky enough to experience 34 of those butterflies but this is changing. Species like the comma never used to make it as far as Scotland, but over the past few years, they have slowly been making their way further and further north. 
and there's now been regular sightings in the Scottish Highlands. This is thought to be happening due to the wetter winters and warmer summers we've been experiencing because of climate change. This has not only given the butterflies perfect conditions, but it's also helped improve the growth of the caterpillar's favourite food source, the common nettle. These nettles are also important for some other butterflies, like the more common peacock and small tortoiseshell butterflies, which you're likely to see in your garden at this time of year. And these chrysalis belong to the peacock butterfly and are expected to come out within the next week. Some butterflies are specialists. This means that they need specific habitats and environmental conditions to survive. Take this, the ringlet. This ringlet can be found in areas like this, so it's a grassland specialist. And this time of year, in the Scottish Isles, there's a mass immersion of these butterflies. Another grassland specialist is the common blue butterfly. But this butterfly also relies on ants to survive. You see, the caterpillar mimics an ant larvae, so the ants mistake it as one of their own, taking it down to the nest, where it then eats all the ants larvae before pupating within the protection of the nest to come out the next year to start the whole cycle all over again. So you see, without habitats like nettles and grasslands, we wouldn't have many of our amazing butterflies. Butterflies are known as indicator species. This means by monitoring them, it allows us to see if their habitat or environment is changing. This is why we need you guys to record them all across the UK. And this is where you guys come in. For the next three weeks, we're asking you to head out and count all the butterflies you see. It's great fun and really easy to do. All you've got to do is go for a walk or sit in your garden for 15 minutes and count all the butterflies that you can find. You can do it as many times as you want over the three weeks. But remember, if you're doing it in your garden, leave a gap between the times doing it, just so you don't count the same butterflies. And to help you record and identify the butterflies and day flying moths that you find, there's this really handy app that you can download from Butterfly Conservation with all the information you need. As well as that, there's also a handy print out picture guide that you can use, which is just as good as the app. This guide can cover all across the UK, so make sure you choose the print out one that best suits you. Once you've finished counting, remember to upload your findings via the app or through the website at Butterfly Conservation Big Butterfly Count. So what are you waiting for? Get counting! Great message and enthusiasm there from Xander. Thank you so much for yeah. sending in that wonderful clip. Always amazed by your knowledge and your passion, Xander. You're a fantastic young naturalist. And also his presenting yeah. skills. Oh. Some of those pieces that he was doing yeah. without a script, you know, no auto cue, unless, mm -hmm. you know, unless his parents have invested in a very, very expensive piece of auto cue, which they haven't. Um, you know, they're like 45 seconds long. They're really good. And they're word perfect. Yeah. Very talented. Very talented young presenter there, Xander. You've got a bright career ahead of yeah. you if you want it, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. That's Very for sure. And you can keep up to date with all of Xander's work over on his YouTube channel, which is www.xanderjo.co.uk. -E so go onto his website, you'll see all of his videos there and all the latest information from Xander. Okay. Now we set you a quiz mm. at the top of the programme as ever. Uh, let's have another little listen. Uh, it's an easy one, an easy one. Who got it right? Well, everyone. Everyone. Absolutely. Well, almost everyone. So let's go. I've got a selection of names here. So on Facebook, we've got Debs, Anne, Sue, Lorna, Julie, Janet, Ka uh, Kieran, Ian, Elizabeth. On Twitter, Paula, Baz, Mostly Wild, Michelle, Elaine, Heather, Caroline. YouTube, we've got Simon, Dryo, Alex, Vivian, Hannah, PJ, Stuart, Chris, Elizabeth, John, Holly, Annis, Ian. Oh, yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Obviously, the song, yeah. the, 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 the absolutely quintessential song of the, the Tawny Owl. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> no. No. Skylark, of Skylark. course. Oh, my goodness. Enough to lift the spirits at oh, any point. Beautiful song. Just stunning. Not only the song, actually, mm. but when you... Bobby spotted. Sorry, I thought that was... A sp I just thought, just for one, I just wish for a moment, I thought it was a spotted flycatcher. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, 
knew it was a robin. But the, the yes, um, so oh, when they're miles oh, are up there with their big wings, so their big lungs, oh. disappearing so high you can barely see them up in the sky and you can still Beautiful. hear that cascade of notes raining down. It's stunning. Oh, what a thing that is. Love skylarks. What a thing that is. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, top so work. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. So that was an easy one. Next week, was... something a little bit harder, I yeah, think. Yeah, maybe we'll ramp it up again. If you were watching last week, you'll know that Lucy Lapwing had uh, devised her own face mask. We were talking mm. about not using disposable ones and uh, getting rid of those as quickly as possible and making sure that you were buying a face mask which wasn't as disposable and therefore cutting down on waste. And Lucy Lapwing had done her own design with Swifts on it. Here you can see it. And she was going to be selling these on to raise money for swift conservation. And I'm very pleased to say that she has raised £200. Over £200, over. Now, I believe. Yeah, Is over right? £200 for Fantastic swift conservation stuff. charity. So um, you can find out more if you go on at Lucy Lapwing. Um, you can see her on social media uh, and you can find out where to purchase your very own and raise some money for Swift Conservation. Yeah, turn a pound for Swift Conservation is yeah. pretty good, isn't it, really? It's some, pretty good. Nest boxes going yeah, up well somewhere. Done, Lucy. Yeah, really, really, really good. Yeah. Almost out of time for us now. A um, couple of birthdays. A couple of birthdays. A couple of birthdays, I think we've got. Um, so we've got Val Joyce. Very happy birthday to you. Um, we have got Marcel and Bet. It's your 49th wedding anniversary today and Bet's birthday on Sunday. So very happy wedding anniversary. 49, what's your secret? Brilliant, well done. A couple more here. Um, We've got yes. Kika and Mark who were married nine years ago today. So I hope so you have a ha happy anniversary. Mm -hmm. And it's Paula, Ma uh, you know, at Mank Rock Chick's birthday yesterday. Uh, Paula is a great supporter of um, all of the things that we do when it comes to our mm. campaigning. A very great supporter. I think she's been to every Hen Howie a day, for instance. I'm sure she'll be joining us online tomorrow. Um, and she also does a lot of great work for Orca. We haven't talked about Orca, you know. We should mm. do something about, you know, a bit more about the marine environment. Oh, I've been saying that for ages. I know. You've just come up with that like it's your Hold idea. I've been saying this for so long. Honestly, and you've just come on in like it's a novel idea that you've just come up with. It's not just my, be it's not my best day, is it really? No, I've, I've got myself into trouble with words <laughs> and now, now that. But anyway, uh, Paula does uh, yeah. a lot of work as an observer for Orca, mm. and they do some brilliant surveys from ferries that to and fro from the UK, uh, surveying, of course, cetaceans, whales yes. and dolphins. They come up with a lot of important data which informs conservation. So we've got to do something about that at some yeah. point. We yeah. have to get a report from one of those observers and, and put it out. That would be re mm. really, really good. And also next week, we've got Paul Halfley is going to be joining us as a live guest. So yes. We're going to ask him if well, obviously... Well, we've come up with an idea. As we were watching his stuff and the films were rolling, we were thinking of ideas and we thought we might, if Paul is willing, yeah. um, give it a go ourselves and see what he thinks of our attempt yeah. at uh, mimicking birds. Yeah. And being well, hold on. To... No, you, I think if you're going to do any, yeah. try and emulate what Paul does, you've got to draw the bird. Yes, so okay. So you'd have to do a drawing. And then you'd have to do your makeup and clothing to look like it. Okay, let's do it. What have you got in terms of makeup? Oh, I've oh, got enough. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got oh, my um, cruelty-free makeup. I've got all of it. I've already come up yeah. with a plan to do my favourite UK species. What a name! Yeah. Your favourite UK Absolute species. Absolute favourite. Absolute favourite. It's going to be like species. a pigeon. <laughs> it's going to be a pigeon, or like a blackbird, or oh, I like blackbirds. They blackbird would be quite cool. Yeah. Well. Anyway. I'd, 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 have to have a, I'd have to have a sort of yellow nose. I'm not sure mm. that would be... We have a semi fledge on semi -fledge. our black so, hooks. Oh, yes. Se and then they've gone. Yeah. They've already gone. But I did say I think they've been going and coming yeah. back. I think that, you know, that I, don't, I don't think we can claim that as a, as a live no. fledge. No. I, mean, I think that was a bit optimistic. I think they've been going and coming yeah. back because they've they're, been they're quite substantial. Them. And it's likely, of course, they come back to the nesting platform mm. because that's where the parents are bringing the food, which they would still be regurgitating for them yeah. at this stage. So I think that's, mm. that's that. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a shout out to Isla, who is seven years old. Now, she, I, I got a message from, I believe, Isla's mother this morning um, to say that even on Isla's holiday, she was really busy doing her Great Britain tidy mission. Um, where she has been cleaning beaches in uh, North ha uh, Northumberland of broken glass, plastic beads, and all that foam. So well done, Isla. Even on your holidays, you're out busy making the environment the best place. So thank you for doing that. Really important stuff. Beach cleans are a great thing to do. They are better They're than good just fun. sitting on the beach. Wow. But, you know, you Water, could, but you could do sand, a bit of both. And salt. You could do a bit of both. You know, Water, it's nice weather. Get out to the beach. I love beaches. 
but I don't want to take my clothes off there. I don't want that sand between my toes. Uh, one last <laughs> thing before we go. Uh, my, my very good friend, Jeffrey Dashwood, the sculpture, oh, uh, sculptor, what? actually not a sculpture. <laughs> he's, a, he, <laughs> he's a sculpture. <laughs> he's a sculpture. He's a bronze sculpture. <laughs> uh, the sculptor, uh, Jeffrey Dashwood, has his summer exhibition. Now, obviously, early in the year, it was planned. Um, Hampshire Open Studios events would have been uh, taking place, but they were cancelled because of COVID. But now he's put in all sorts of measures so social distancing can be observed and you can visit him at his place in Hampshire and look at his remarkable work and that will be on the Sunday the 23rd to Monday the 31st of August inclusive. Mm. Jeffrey is a very very talented he man. Is, he is an absolute his genius. His sculptures he's a genius, are absolutely stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. He's got the most amazing work and they're just so simple and elegant and utterly beautiful, really capturing the essence of all the species that he does. Yeah. So Details yeah, online. Go and have a look at Jeffrey Dashwood.com. Jeffrey Dashwood.com. Mm. You'll find all the details there. Okay. Uh, Hen Harrier Day mm. tomorrow. Yes. We'll, we'll be on. We're really excited and looking forward to that and have some great guests, some great uh, great ideas being bounced around, some beautiful pictures, obviously, of Hen Harriers. Mm -hmm. We've got competitions, got a bit of art, got all sorts of things coming up throughout the course of the day. Right. It's going to be a festival of Hen Harriers. It is. It is. It's more of a festival. That's yes. what it's going to be. Yeah. Anyway, we'll be here festing <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> and next week, you never know, we might be here sat, you know, trying to emulate the remarkable skills of Paul Hartley, yeah. dressed and trying to look, you know, subtly. What I like about Paul is he does it so beautifully mm. and subtly, you know, just a, a little bit of detail around the eye, the yeah. very, very careful choice of the clothing. I, I, I'm prepared to give it a go. I think we can... See you next week. I'm nervous. <laughs> Bye.